am the learned turkey. In the me you may have heard, generally recognize a very wise old bird. Most erudite of animals with several degrees, a handsome fan of feathers too, but very knobbly knees. A gallinaceous bird of divinity, that's me. Funerals and christenings for a reasonable fee. I am the reverend turkey of the hill. Gobble, gobble, gobble. Hello! It's Quango Pongle, isn't it? Quango Pangle? Quingle Pangle? Uh, Quango Pangle? Oh, of course, it's Quango Wongo. How do you do, Quango? I trust you're in good wealth. Or health. Hmm. Is this a Boshal or a Cisnus call? Delightful. Anyway, Quango, why are you here? A wedding? <laughs> But I'm already married. Oh, of course. Why didn't you tell me earlier, Quango? Oh, and the oh, how do you do, Owl? Oh, and the beautiful pussycat. So you must be the brushing bride, uh, the blushing bride. Beautiful, beautiful. So tell me, you two, how long have you been married? Oh, of course, stupid. Oh, anyway, Quango, have did the ring? All right. All right, now place the baby gently in my hands. Uh, pardon? Oh, I am dearly befumbled. Oh, I am sorry. It's, it's no good. Uh, it's been, uh, I have to book it up in my look. I mean, uh, look it up in my book. It's been so long since I've done a wedding. Or a wedding. Anyway. Wongo, you better come here and help me get ready. Smells of damp wind in there. All those dried up pots of paint. You must be a busy man, your granddad. Old brushes, rusty nails, jam jars full of Goodness knows what. Ugh. What did they call someone who saves things? A hoarder. That's it. Your granddad is a hoarder. They say a lot of men get like that after a certain age. Can't bear to part with stuff, even when it's of no use to them or anyone else anymore. When he gets home, he won't know what's hit him. He won't be able to find anything, even though he's got it all organized. He'll complain, you watch. So you preferred the clutter. My hair brush up is the same as this one. Only more cobwebs. There were spiders everywhere, all shapes and sizes. He used to call the garden shed his special place. Never could say goodbye to anything. Whenever we used to go and visit him and it was time to go home, he'd disappear. We'd kiss Karen goodbye and ask where Granddad was, and he'd admit to the shop or taking the dog for a walk. That last night in the hospital, when we all knew it was time to say goodbye, he came up with some excuse to see the nurse. She came out and said that he'd fallen asleep and visiting hours were over, so we might as well go home. Well, died that night. He managed to avoid saying goodbye to the very end. He was an evacuee in World War II. Grant said he shouted goodbye to his mother as she waved him off from the platform. He got sent to live in the countryside, sent letters home and got letters back. That's how it was for all of them. Then he got told that he couldn't go home because, well, there was no home to go to. My great grand and grand adopted him. He never saw his real family again. When he was all grown up with his own family, Grant always said he was a bit embarrassed about being abandoned. And he always had this thing about saying goodbye. Just couldn't bring himself to say it again. 
ever. You know, Aisha, I think we should sort your granddad's stuff into some old bin liners. Let him sort through it when he gets back, yeah? Well, hello everybody, I'm here. I don't think you need to look any further for your mess world. Why not save all the expense of a lavish show and just crown me now? Why am I so sure? Who are you, dear? And what do you know about beautiful women? Ah, don't answer that. We haven't got time to waste. Well, you see, I have a magic mirror and it is able to look at all of the women in the world and report back to me who's the most beautiful. And every time I have asked it, well, apart from a little hiccup a while ago, every time it has told me that I am the most beautiful. What was the little hiccup? Oh, some poor girl who was very lovely. But alas, she had a most unfortunate accident. <laughs> I'm sorry. It does so upset me when I think of her. I have such a tender heart, you see. I want peace and love for everyone all over the world. That is my sincere wish. What talents do I have? Well, I'm a very accomplished actress. Why, sometimes, to amuse my friends, I dress up as an old witch, and they tell me I'm really convincing. Would you like to buy anything, my dear? How about this pretty necklace? Yes, of course you can try it on, because it's poison, you stupid little girl. Um, sorry, I got a bit carried away there. Good though, aren't I? My figure is superb, my skin is as soft as satin, and I never seem to age. I could go on being Miss World for years. And I have a very powerful effect on men. They do anything I say. See that young man in the audience there? That handsome huntsman who is shaking in his boots? You would do anything I asked, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? There, you see. Of course, he does work for me, so he couldn't really disagree. So. What do you say? Do you want me as Miss World or not? I look wonderful in a swimsuit. I could pay off any of the other pathetic little candidates. And I could make life very difficult for all of you. Oh, what's that? My mirror? It says what? It's a fake. It's a fraud. That's what I think of you, you stupid mirror. Now where's that huntsman gone? Come here, you've got some very serious questions to answer. Where are you? <laughs> I love someone too. Person I love, I lost. He was a boy, just a boy. And I was a very young girl. When I was 16, I made the discovery. All at once, and much, much too completely. It was like you had suddenly turned a blinding on something that had always been half in shadow. That's how it struck the world for me, but I wasn't lucky. Deluded. There was something different about the boy. A nervousness, a softness, a tenderness which wasn't like a man's. Although he wasn't the least bit effeminate looking, still, that thing was there. He came to me for help. I didn't know that. I didn't know anything. I 
until after our marriage, when we'd run away and come back, and all I knew was I had failed him. In some mysterious way, we couldn't give him the help he needed, but couldn't speak of. He was in the quicksands, clutching at me, but I wasn't holding him out. I was slipping with him. I didn't know that. I didn't know anything except that I loved him unendurably, but couldn't find a way to help him or help myself. Then I found out, in the worst possible ways, by coming into a room that I thought was empty, which wasn't empty, but had two people in it. The boy I had married, and an older man who had been his friend for years. Afterwards, we pretended like nothing happened. Yes, the three of us drove out to Moon Lake as in the trunk, laughing all the way. We danced the Varsaviana. In the middle of the dance, the boy I had married broke away from me and ran up the casino. A few moments later, a shot. I ran out. All did. All ran out to see the terrible thing at the edge of the lake. I couldn't get near for the crowding. Then somebody caught my arm. Don't go any closer. Come back. You don't want to see. See? See what? Then I heard the voices say, Alan. Alan. The gray boy, he struck the revolver in his mouth and fired. So the back of his head had been blown away. It was because on the dance floor, unable to stop myself, I suddenly said, I saw. I know. You disgust me. From that day forward, the searchlight, which had been turned on the world, was turned off again. And never, for one moment since, has there been anybody stronger than this kitchen candle. No, she doesn't like schools, give her panic attacks. And I don't want you to come to my house. Listen, I reckon you owe me 10 quid. I went to see the Midsummer stream. It was rubbish. And I know it was about 35, kept chucking herself all over the place, you know, tossing her hair back and flinging her arms about. Just like young people do when we're in love. Nearly ruptured herself. And she was about six inches shorter than Hermia as well, so she'd got these gross high heels, and Hermia had to bend at the knees all throughout the choral scene. And the mechanicals wandered about in the audience and talked to us. I hate that. And Peter Quinn sang the stalls and shouting designs from there. And the fairies all lived in cardboard boxes and had tattoos. And it went on for nearly four hours. I reckon ours is better. And I couldn't afford it. Hey, and guess what? Theseus and Hippolyta played Oberon and Titania. Isn't that original? Everybody loved it except me. I wanted to get up and kill them all. Bunch of no hopers. It was everything you say was wrong. I really love that play, and I don't think that this had any respect. And it wasn't...
Magic. I know. The best in this kind are but shadows, and the worst, no worse if imagination amend them. Must be your imagination then, not theirs. I like magic. I suppose I'm talking rubbish. Everyone else says it's brilliant. And they're paid to be in the imagination business, aren't they? Now the government right to criticize them. It's the only way. I don't fit in. Let them battle it out amongst themselves. I'll step outside and close the door behind me. I'm fed up of being pushed around. I didn't ask to be born. I don't owe God anything. However, you look at it, in the end, I had no choice. I don't blame my parents, but they should have seen this coming. They were old enough to know what they were doing. If I hadn't been born as an infant, I might have had some sense to be somebody else. Why should I have to suffer because everyone else is already here? I would have to be soft in the head. If someone gives me a rabbit dog as a present, I give him back his rabbit dog. And if he won't take it back, I do the human thing and I would have to be soft in the head. Being born is totally random, so do you think after careful consideration you could it's enough to make you want to shoot yourself. At least, the weather's considerate. It looked like rain all day, and now it's clearing. Nothing jars, earth and sky are like a transparent gauze. <laughs> Everything breathes contentment. There's something shameful in having been human without experiencing the most human thing that there is. You went to Egypt, sir, and you didn't see the pyramids? I'm not going to cry today, and I'll try not to think about my funeral. Melchior, will I wreath at my coffin? The minister will comfort my parents. The head will quote examples from history. I don't suppose I'll get a tombstone. I'd like a pure white marble urn on a black granite plinth. Not that I'll miss it. Memorials are for the not for the dead. I'm not going to cry. It'll probably take me a year to say goodbye to them all in my thoughts. All of those who wonder. And it's good that I can look back on it all without bitterness. All of those wonderful evenings spent with Melchior. Under the river by the willows. By the forester's edge by the mountain. <laughs> when it comes to the moment, I will force every fiber of my being to think of whipped cream. It's easy to swallow. It's filling. And it has a pleasant aftertaste. I am going to the altar like the Etruscan youth in the legend that brought his brother's prosperity in the years to come. I shall savor every moment of the secret thrill of letting go. I can't help feeling sorry for myself. This world gave me the cold shoulder
other side. I see friendly, sympathetic faces. The headless queen, the headless queen, compassion, willing to embrace me. Your commandments are for those who need telling what to do. I have earned my ticket to freedom. <laughs> Chrysalis opens <laughs> and the butterfly flutters away. texted but um, it felt weird, posh like, sending you letters I put, dear mom. <laughs> yeah. I thought if it was just a text I would put like alright or something, but um, it's weird isn't it? Sending letters. Did you get them? I never knew so I just kept writing. Like on those shows when they get lost families together, they say that, don't they? They say for years they thought you were a birthday gift to him and they show them big pile of cards and Christmas presents and stuff. When's your birthday? I was thinking, I don't even know when your birthday is. I know it's sometime in March, but uh, I don't know exactly when. So we could do something. We could do something nice. Did you get the letters? I didn't know that. Oh, I don't know you can read very well. I didn't think, but uh, it makes sense. Now that I'm thinking of it, it makes sense of a lot of things. You know, forms and stuff, anything official. Paul can help you with that. <laughs> Paul writes his forms. Me and Tash, he's my friend. Me and Tash talk about He's all right as Paul. They're not all like him, you know, social workers, but he is. He could help you with reading that forms. I was thinking um, we could meet and start. And to start, we could keep doing this. And then soon enough, you know, things can get back to normal. Yeah, we got places to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally understandable. Um, but it's been three years. Yeah, it has. I'm 15. But I'll be 16 next month, and you know, it all changes. So, can I have your number? I can text you. to you, truly I am, but I pray that you are the only one who can answer my question. I am told that you will kill me, that you will cook me up and eat me with your iron teeth. I do not think I am being unwise. I need to know the answer to my question. Where should I look for a falcon who is also my friend? I think it is some sort of enchantment, and you know all there is to know about enchantments. So, you say that only one person in the twice ten kingdoms and beyond the thrice ten lands will be able to enchant a person to become a falcon? She as wicked as you. It is said that you are the most wicked woman in all the wide world. If she is wicked and her people love her, then I cannot know how wicked she truly is, so she must use tricks to keep the truth in them. For all your wickedness, you do not deceive anyone in that way. So perhaps you are not the most wicked of the two of you? I only want to find my falcon. I do not know why my friend has been enchanted. But you've answered my question. Will you kill me now?
shield, your real mama. Shot her in the face, just like them papers say. You had to have known something was off all these years, deep inside. Raised you as my own ever since Lella had you. It's a miracle you came out as healthy as you did. Now, I promised I'd raise you as my, on my own, on her behalf. She'd recover from drugs, relapse, recover, relapse. This went on forever. I, I met and fell in love with a woman named Diamond. She was a diamond, all right. She could shine as bright as the sun or hurt your real bed if you stared too long. Somewhere along the way, oil and diamond became a thing. Jealousy. I don't know. I was betrayed, de destroyed, and well, I tied diamond up to a rowboat. Rode on out to the swamp, shot a few holes in the boat and watched it sink. With Diamond's shiny eyes staring back at me the entire time. Waited till she found out and rode on back in a different rowboat. Of course, got Lil's drug and got out of control and I, I, I think the last straw came when she threatened me. Saying she was gonna go to the police to try to take you away from me. I mean, if she was planning on selling you for drug money, I, I had a choice to make, didn't I? I, I came up with a bank robber job we could pull together. I promised her all the money in the world that would get us back on track. I thought long and hard as to what I was gonna do on that day. And the final verdict in my mind was that I was going to take her down. So that's what I did. Hello there. Have you got through anybody in the past hour? Well, Who's this then? Huh. Hmm. Traveling to DFEA? Got a job lined up? Got families and relations there? Well, I'm right, aren't I? Good, good. Okay, show me your hands. Ah, I said show me your hands. Thank you. These don't look like a carpenter's hands. No. Not a worker's hands, but like a gentleman's hands. An aristocrat's hands. Oh, a priest! Something grander, perhaps. An A, perhaps. By the belly on you, you look like you'd enjoyed a rich, soft life. Take him away! Just as well I showed up, isn't it? You can smell the incense and roast duck miles away from that one. There's some bloody Englishman sending aristocrats out of the country headed by a devil whose name nobody knows but who goes by the name Scarlet Pimpernel. Only last week we heard he was in Paris and stationed twice the guards there, but still he got through. How? <laughs> Makes me spoon just to think of it. I was at Bibbit's gate. Captain of the guard walks up and asks if he passed through a wine vendor with empty crates. Yes, but don't you worry, says Bibbot, because I sounded every last one of them. <gasps> you fool, says the captain of the guard. Of course they were empty, because that wine vendor was Scarlet Pimpernel. In the little boy was a lady Marchriat. <gasps> Which way did they go? <clears throat> they went up Catriat Street. <sighs> Your head will pay for this treachery, says the captain. After them, boys. And away the captain leaves. <sighs> but the cap, but the wine vendor 
wasn't the Scarlet Pimpernel. No. The captain was the Scarlet Pimpernel, and every single one of his boys was stinking aristocrat. You want answers? You want answers? You can't handle the truth. Because the truth is that we live in a world that has walls. And those walls need to be guarded by men with guns. Who's going to do it? You? You, Lieutenant Weinberg? I have a greater responsibility than you can possibly fathom. You weep for Santiago's death and you curse the Marines. You have the luxury. The luxury of the blind. The luxury of not knowing what I know that Santiago's death, while tragic, saves lives. While my existence grotesque and incomprehensible to you, saves lives. You can't handle it. Because in places that you don't like to talk about at parties, you want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. We use words like honor, code, loyalty. We use these words as a backbone to a life spent defending something. You use them as a punchline. I don't have the time nor the inclination to explain myself to a man who rises and sleeps under the blanket of the very freedom which I provide and then questions in the manner in which I provide it. I prefer to say thank you and went on your way. Otherwise, I suggest you grab a weapon and stand a post. Either way, I don't give a damn what you think you're entitled to. I did the job you sent me to do. You're goddamn right I did. What the hell is going on? Captain? What the hell is going on? I'm not familiar with Article 39A. I did my job and I would do it again. Now, I'm getting on that plane and going back to my base. What? I ordered a code red and you're all going to pieces like a ladies auxiliary? Be in charge of the crime? You know, this is. What? Well, I. This is. This is funny, you know, this is. I'm gonna tear the eyes right out of your head! You messed with the wrong Marine! You have no idea how to defend a nation, Chafee! All you did is weaken one tonight. All you did was put people in danger tonight. Give yourself a pat on the back. Sweet dreams, son. practicing my clarinet all morning and I really thought I was going to get in this time. I know a marching band is competitive, especially for the hockey team, but I had a good feeling about it all morning. Time's a charm, my mom said. <laughs> but then that guy who wears all the jewelry stole my crutch. My mom said it was okay for me to practice my song outside since it wasn't raining and I was only playing marches, but he ran up to me from across the street. He was yelling something like, Shut the hell up! or something. He knocked my stand over, he grabbed one of my crutches. I tried to run after him, but I'm not a very fast song on a crutch.
I didn't let him get my clarinet, though. I had to toss it under the picnic table. I think one of the keys got bent a little, but hey. <laughs> At least I saved it. Anyway, now I have to sort of hop and walk to get anywhere. I don't think I can make it to the gym on time with only one crutch. And since you have that crutch you used in fourth grade when you were Tiny Tim, I was wondering if I could maybe borrow it. I know you wanted to stay in mint condition, but I won't mess it up. I had to send over a little since it's a kitty crutch, but that means that I have a strong back. I don't mind. Look, you're the reason my leg is broken anyway. You're the one who told me to jump off the truck so that Taylor would see it and fell in love with me. But since the truck was going 30 miles an hour and you weren't supposed to be going that fast, I just got this broken leg instead. The hospital did have a TV, though. My mom and dad don't let me watch TV at home. I watched an entire season of Game of Thrones in one day. Taylor didn't fall in love with me. And now I have to hop and walk. So I don't care if you don't want fingerprints on your tiny crunch. I think you owe me. This is my chance to get in the marching band and show Taylor that I'm worth something. So give me your crutch. <clears throat> I'm gonna tell your mom. Now where to start? Ah, sugar, flour, eggs, Above all, for a lot to do. Bread, one kind of peaches, nutmeg. Now all we need is a bowl and a baking tray. Not forgetting the apron. Hello viewers, I've brought all these ingredients to show you how to make a maple leaf wonder. Firstly, you take a handful of sugar and flour, place them in the bowl and add four eggs. I watched my mother doing this. Break the eggs into the mixture and mix using your fingertips. It does tend to stick a bit, but you can always lick it off. Now add the peaches. Oh, I need a can opener and my hands are a bit messy. Uh, now with your hands, mix in the peaches. It's a bit sloppy, but remember, this is fun, fun, fun! Now for the nutmeg. And we mustn't forget the bread, which of course I would have prepared earlier. And this should have been greased. Oh well, forget the greasing and pour on, or lump on, the peach mixture. There, and bake it in a preheated oven which I forgot to turn on for 20 minutes. So let's make that 30 minutes. Mom, is that you? You're early. Well, I've got a surprise for you. I'll tidy the kitchen later. No, it's not too bad. Really? No, she doesn't like schools. Give her panic attacks, and uh, I don't want you to come into my house. Listen, um, I reckon you owe me ten quid. I went to see that Midsummer Night's Dream you were talking about. It was rubbish. Helena was about thirty-six. Kept chucking herself all over the place, flinging her arms about and switching her hair back. You know, just like young people always do when they're in love. Nearly ruptured herself. 
She was about six inches shorter than Hermia as well, so she had on these gross high heels, and Hermia had to bend the knees all throughout the choral scene. And the mechanicals wandered about on stage and talked to us. I hated that. And Peter Quint sat in the stalls and shouted his lines from there. And the fairies all lived in cardboard boxes and had tattoos. It went on for nearly four hours. I reckon ours was better. I couldn't afford it. Hey, and, uh, and guess what? Theseus and Holtlia played Oberon and Titania. Isn't that original? Everyone liked it except me. I wanted to get upstage and kill them all. Bunch of no-hopers. It was everything you say was wrong, you know? I really liked that play, and I just felt like this one had no respect. And it wasn't magic. I know. The best in the imagination business are but shadows, and the worst no worse is the imagination of men. Them. It must be your imagination then, not theirs. I like magic. Anyway, suppose I'm driving rubbish. Everyone else likes it, and they're paid to be in the imagination business, aren't they? But no right to judge. This is it. Open night. The moment I've been waiting for. The moment I've been working towards for months. My debut as a performer. I'm about to tread the boards to become a thespian. It may only be a small role, but I'm beginning the journey of my dreams. And one day, who knows? I could be playing the lead. No. I've gone blank. What's my first line? My first line. Oh, come on. I know it for goodness sake. I've rehearsed it long enough. It's... It's... Nothing. Nothing. I can't remember a thing. Oh no, this can't be happening. Just say something. Anything. Anything at all from the scene. As long as I say something, I'll be alright. Oh, 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 my. 
okay. Because we're starting to swim. Oh no, I'm going to faint. No! I've got to hold it together. Breathe. Something will come to me in a minute. Just give it time. Hey, what's happening? They've been carrying on without me. They've skipped my lines and they're carrying on. As if I'm not even here. Uh, how dare they? They didn't even give me a chance. So they realize this is my big moment? I have to take back control of the situation. It's not too late. Just have a quick look at my script. I left it over there in the wings. What I have to do is casually move over to... Hey! Who turned out the lights? Blackout? You mean it's all over? But I didn't even... Wait a minute. The audience is... clapping? They want to show their appreciation. Well, I'd better give them what they want. After all, it'd be rude not to. picture on chat snap or instabook and wants to know if i made any new friends on facegram oh and she's for oh, message i mean i get it once upon a time there was no such thing as social media no internet 
and definitely no smartphones. But I swear, if I have to hear one more time about how one mom was my age, she'd come home from school and wait for the dial-up to launch from the landline to check her inbox if anyone had messaged her, my head will explode! Ugh. Actually, my grandma is the funniest. She can't understand why me and my first 10 cousins don't share mobile phones. How would that even work? No one would be able to finish a conversation and they'd all be snooping on my messages. I'm the oldest, you see, so I have the most interesting things to talk about. Oops. Anyway, yesterday I was with my cousin Penny and Nana comes in. Now, logic says that if mom's a cave woman, Nana must be a dinosaur, because, well, they came first. So, Penny and I were activating accounts when Nana says, I don't like the sounds of those internet addresses you've chosen, girls. They've got your names in them for the whole world to see. That's how people get caught on the web, you know. <laughs> she means email. <laughs> you should think more creatively, girls. Lonely for you and chilling for you. <laughs> I can't stop myself now. Now, now, why wouldn't be lonely and chilling? You know, they're actually meant to be connected <laughs> to your name. She gasped wide-eyed. What do you mean, why? You're named after a flower and you're named after a unit of money. Lou is a flower and a shilling is a unit of money. Honestly, Viola, I thought you were smarter. <laughs> Poor Nana still doesn't know why Penny snored to lemonade out of her nose. All right, I laughed until I cried. <laughs> I loved her, even though I didn't know what a scallywag meant. But I knew it must be a nice name because she also called Benji a scallywag, and I could tell that she loved him very much and never hurt him or ignored him, even though she also called him a monster and a horror and a terror. I, I would sometimes spend hours walking up and down the road just so my lady could say, hello, scallywag. And I could say, hello, back. Sometimes she would say, walking again, scallywag. And other times she would say, off on your travel, scallywag. One thing she never asked is why I was always walking up and down the road. One day I was walking down the road, deciding whether or not I was jaunting or traveling when I overheard my next door neighbors, the Bannermans. They had been talking to my lady and I could overhear Mr. Bannerman say, she's a stupid old cow, isn't she? Well, I was angry. I was angry. I was so upset and too confused to look her in the eye and say, hello. Just so angry. I, I had to run. I had to pass her. I couldn't stop, couldn't smile, couldn't look her in the eye and say hello just had to run. I just had to run to my house and sit in my place. Just had to, I had to run and sit in my place. And I sat in my place and my invisible friend sat in my place. We sat there and we fumed about the Bannermans and my invisible friend said, something's gotta be done. I agreed, but I didn't know what. So we just sat there in silence for a while until my invisible friend said that if the Bannermans were going down the road, which they were, that means that they're going out. And if they're going out, which they must have been, then that means they're not in. 
And if they're not in, which they weren't, that means we should throw a brick through their window. And because I can't do it because I'm invisible, which she was, then you'll have to do it. Which I didn't want to do because it was wrong and I was scared. This is when me and my invisible friend started fighting. And she told me that if I didn't throw a brick through the bannerman's window, that she would leave and never speak to me again. My invisible friend. The voice in my head. We talked with each other. We played with each other. She was reliable. She threatened to leave. She, she said she'd go. I was only eight. I didn't realize what was happening, what, what was beginning. I was just scared. I was just scared of loneliness, immediate loneliness. I didn't know what was happening, what was beginning, but that was the starting point. That is when I began to lose control. Chatting, Kathy. <laughs> uh, it's the first time I'm hearing me speak to. I mean, it's the first time I'm hearing me speak to you in particular. So, um, did you even know that my name was Kathy? That I sit behind you in the homeroom? Oh, well, I've never seen you look back. I mean, I've seen your back, but I've never seen you, you know, looking back. Oh god. Okay. So, I'm taking a public speaking class, and here we are, in public speaking to you. Um, I was hoping it would be a little more private than this. Patsy, could you excuse us? Thanks. Okay. So, in public speaking class, they say tell a story, some anecdote that lets your audience know who you are. Well, when I was six, I was a proud bluebird of the Campfire Girls of America. As a bluebird, I had to sell mittens door to door. When my brother found out, he started laughing. How is she supposed to sell them if she never makes a peep? That's what he said, so. I could feel my eyes getting a little wet and I think my mom must have noticed because then she chimed in. <laughs> She's not gonna find her so adorable. She won't have to make a peep and you are going to go with her. <laughs> so she got me dressed in my official bluebird outfit, a white button up short sleeve shirt, a blue knee length skirt, knee high white socks and white Mary Jane shoes. <laughs> oh, my bluebird pin, of course. <laughs> and she wrote out a little introduction on an index card. Hello, my name is Kathy. How would you like to purchase a box of mint thins to benefit the Campfire Girls of America? She wrote down all the info they needed to buy the cookies. See, now she's armed with cuteness and the right words. <laughs> she smiled, pat my head. Now fly, my bluebird. Nothing can stop you now. So my brother took me door to door, and I'd walk up the walkway all by myself. My legs would shake, and when someone answered, usually a mom, I'd, I'd find myself unable to speak. But I had my words. I'd hand them the introduction card, and each mom would smile and buy a box of my cookies. You know, 
I sold every box. I wanted to tell you that story because sometimes you have the words, it's just, it's really difficult for them to, it, it's difficult for them to come out. See, I know you were going to ask me uh, something, and then Patsy told you that I think you're ugly because your acne medicine isn't working, and that I'd never go to the dance with you because I think you smell like old socks. Uh, th that's not true. I, I never really said those things, and I'd rather not say the following out loud, so I wrote it down. <laughs> Say. Oh, I've got a blank note card and a pen, if that'd be easier.